All right. So monumentally farms now in 1909. Okay, so this is the background that the British they had they were observing all of these latest developments of the subcontinent, how um the how how the Indians reacted to the partition of Bengal, how they reversed the partition, and then the reaction of the Indians on that as well. Um, establishment of Muslim League, similar deputation, all of these important events that took place years before um, 1909. Okay, not the reversal of partition, but except for that, all of the other events took place before the reversal. Um, so after these latest developments, there were obviously certain clashes between the Hindus and the Muslim community as well. Hindus they had opposed the partition of Bengal. Muslims they were really happy with the partition. Muslims had also given uh, they were also given with separate electorates and increased representation in the councils through similar deputation. Muslims now had their own political party as well. Indian National Congress was campaigning for the Hindu rights more specifically, whereas the Muslim League was campaigning for the Muslim rights. Um, uh, similarly, uh, obviously, there was now an ideology conflict between the two political parties of India. British, they had seen all of this. They wanted to somehow bring up, they wanted to uh, introduce um, a set of reforms to basically uh, satisfy both of the communities. Uh, be, you could say a set of rules that were to be followed by the future governments in India. Molimento reforms were introduced in 1909 and they were opposed by the uh, Indian communities, by the Muslims as well as the Hindus. Just a second. Okay, yeah. So what were the Molimento reforms? These reforms were introduced by Viceroy Lord Minto and Secretary of State John Morley. Um, okay, so you, you need to know the points as well. The reforms that were introduced as part of this, this set of rules. Number one, more members were added in the, in the Imperial Councils. Uh, 50, 60 members were added to Central Executive Council, but their uh, job was to only advise the government. They had no real power except for the advice. Team. Provincial councils, members in those provincial councils were also increased. 50 members were added to larger and 30 members to smaller provincial councils. Muslims were given with separate electorates. All right, so you need to know these points. Um, you need to know the names as well. Lord Minto was the voiceway. Secretary of State was John Morley. Um, you need to also know the number of seats that were increased in the councils. And obviously, the most important point for the Muslim community was the allotment of separate electorates. Okay, so these reforms were basically opposed by the by, by the Congress as well as the Muslim League. Let's see why did the Congress oppose the Molimento reforms in 1909. Number one, uh, the first reason was the the separate electorates given to the Muslims. Congress never wanted these electorates for Muslims. Why? Because obviously, separate electorates meant that Muslims had more weight, more 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 power. Now they could choose their own representatives. And with the, with, with the establishment, establishment of Muslim League, uh, and, and obviously considering the fact that democracy was the mode of government of the subcontinent at, at that time, so Muslims getting more power or getting um, strengthened day by day was a, a threat for the Congress. So similar reputation, Muslims have been granted separate electorates and more weightage, even though their population was not very high. This meant that Muslims were now a separate major and uh, important group in India. The Congress did not like the Muslims to be independent, significant group, but they declared the issue as undemocratic and opposed the reforms, right? So this growing power of Muslims was a threat to the Congress. This is why they opposed these reforms. Second reason was the advisory power. In the local councils, the imperial provincial councils, the members that were increased, they, 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 their, their job was just advisory. The Congress thought that they were actually powerless and British were just trying to somehow show that they were, I mean, they were caring for the Indians. They were increasing their political uh, power, but in reality, they were not. Number two, some of the Congress demands were also rejected. Congress had been demanding self-rule. Uh, we, we talked about self-rule in, in yesterday's lecture, how Congress demanded a home rule. This was, I mean, they had also launched several home rule movements to, to uh, basically convince British for the self-rule that they, I mean, Congress wanted to rule India um, and they wanted the British to leave at that time. So British had rejected this demand. Obviously they were there to stay. Why would they agree to these demands? So 
this is another reason as to why these reforms were rejected by the Congress. Okay, so now, and another important event was the Lucknow Pact of 1916, right after Morley Minto reforms. Um, a few years later, seven years after the Morley Minto reforms, a pact was signed between the Hindus and the Muslims. Um, this was, it was the first time ever that the Hindus and the Muslims had cooperated together for, um, um, like officially they collaborated, cooperated together. This was, I mean, this was a very important event because of that. So Muslim League, so what happened was Congress agreed some demands the Muslims have, for example, the separate electorates, more weightage in Muslim minority areas. So see, this was the first time ever that Congress was agreeing to separate electorates now because they needed cooperation. Muslims and the Hindus, they had to cooperate this time. Muslim League and the Congress, they had to cooperate. So yeah, they agreed to these Muslim demands, such as separate electorates, more weightage in the minority areas. So why, I mean, minority areas where the Muslim population was less, more weightage meant that Muslims had greater representation in, that, in those areas. They had more representatives in the councils from those areas. So yeah, secondly, Muslim League also agreed to give weightage to the Hindu, Hindus in the Hindu minority areas. So this was a mutual agreement between the Hindus and the Muslims. And as a result, they, both of these communities presented a set of demands for the British. So this is what Lucknow Pact was. Hindu movement, we've, we've talked about it a couple of times before as well. So you can just read through this from the notes. Why was the Lucknow Pact signed in 1916? Number one, the Hindu Muslim unity. One of the reasons why the Lucknow Pact was signed was to unite the Hindus and the Muslims so they could form self rule uh, and make such reforms which would satisfy both the communities. Both the Muslims and Hindus decided to have joint venture regarding the protection of the rights in a more effective way. So they realized that Indians were together, they had similar concerns, they had similar. Uh, problems in the subcontinent, and then and then they would all. I mean, and, I mean, obviously the solutions would be more easier uh, if they were to cooperate together and present a set of demands together to the British community. Um, secondly, Muslim League's uh, goal, because now Muslims also had a political party, and the goal of Muslim League um, was also to ensure that the Muslims had their rights protected, and. Uh, after the reversal of partition of Bengal, Muslims felt betrayed because initially the British had given them access to a separate area. They were given these rights as well, but later on, all of this autonomy was taken back. So Muslims, they felt threatened. Congress also was also uh, Congress was always campaigning for for the home rule. So this change in the goal of Muslim League. Uh, which uh, then aligned with the Congress's goal, it resulted in um, bringing both of these communities together. Number three, the third reason was that Congress believed that Muslim League, the goals of Muslim League were similar to the goals of Congress. Initially, when the Muslim League was established in 1906, Congress, the leaders of Congress thought that Muslim League was a pro-British party that their main objective was simply to oppose the Hindus and to favor the British. But gradually with time, they realized that their demands, the objectives, the goals of Muslim League were pretty similar to the goals of Congress. This is why they decided to cooperate together because obviously having, uh, I mean, uh, presenting a joint opposition would, I mean, would mean that British would, uh, I mean, British would have to face a greater level of pressure from the Indian communities. And obviously, uh, they would have to agree to their rights. This is why Lucknow Pact was signed. Describe the importance of Lucknow Pact. Okay, seven, okay, seven mark question again. Three reasons for the importance of Lucknow Pact. So the first importance for the Muslim community was that the electorates were accepted. It was the first time ever that the Congress had accepted separate electorates for the Muslims. Muslims also got a greater weightage in the Muslim minority areas. This meant that the Congress was finally compromising. Congress was trying to um, show the soft corner towards the Muslims now, and this improved the Hindu-Muslim relations. Guys, in this exam, you will, I mean, you will, you will see a lot of questions regarding the change in relations between these communities as well. So these events, the way I'm analyzing these events for you over here, it's very important to take notes side by side 
because you will be asked to write about the relations at every point in history, how Muslims and Hindus cooperated, how were the relations with British at a certain point in time, okay? So it's very important to carefully listen to these analysis and also write these things down. This is why we're moving uh, through these topics um, with, with these questions and then I'm trying to analyze these reasons for you here, okay? And obviously all of the analysis are also written here in front of you on your screens. You can always read through these uh, from the notes on the Google Drive. Okay, secondly, another reason, another importance of the Lucknow Pact was the Congress's uh, um, belief that the Muslim League was not a pro-British party. It meant that the Congress had recognized Muslim League and this acceptance by the Hindus meant that all of the future demands of the Muslims will also be accepted. Thirdly, political leaders, they had realized that the progress that the goal, the objectives were pretty similar. They wanted cooperation in the subcontinent. They wanted uh, unity. They wanted harmony. Um, yeah, and they were facing similar problems. So this is why both of the, this, I mean, this was another importance of Lucknow Pact. Thirdly, okay, now in 1919, three years after the Lucknow Pact was signed, in 1919, Montfort reforms were introduced by the British Secretary Secretary of State Lord Montague and uh, Viceroy Lord Kemsford. In 1919, these reforms were introduced and the major points were the Legislative Council was replaced by the Legislative Assembly. System of diarchy was introduced. We're gonna come to uh, this is point diarchy later. Separate electorates were given to the Muslims and the sects. Number of seats were increased in all councils. Voting rights were increased to 2% only. Muslims and Hindus both rejected these reforms. Okay, so some of the important points, uh, the most important point for this Montfort reforms was this introduction of diarchy. Diarchy was a system where the British introduced two major subjects. Number one, the transferred and the reserved subjects. The reserved subjects were to be controlled directly by the British. And the transferred subjects were to be controlled by the Indians and they were to be supervised by the British. So I'm gonna explain the system to you just a second. Um, okay, so diarchy was a form of government which basically had these two systems, two types of subjects, transferred and reserved. So res transferred subjects were those that were um, under the control of Indians. Indians and over Indians, they were again, obviously British, plus British. So British were supervising these subjects that were given to the Indians and reserved subjects were directly under the control of British. Now, if you look at these subjects, trans for example, uh, local government, forestry, education, health, all of these departments, ministries were given to the Indians. The British had control over the police, power resources, revenue, treasury, foreign relations, defense, etc. Even if you look at these subjects, I've also been mentioned here in the question. Local government, forestry, health, education, public works, police, power resources, press, publication, justice, revenue collection. So these were the transferred subjects and these are the re reserved subjects. So, okay, now these transfer departments that were under the control of Indians were answerable to the provincial legislative councils and those legislative councils had the British governors. So now the Indians felt that British, although they had given this sort of power to the Indians, had given some certain subjects directly under Indian control, but actual power was still in the hands of the British. Okay. So this is what the Indians felt. Why did the Indians oppose the Montfort reforms? Number one, that the okay so guys world war one during world okay so at, at this time in 1914 onwards world war one was taking place in europe and because of that 
in british had british wanted the indians to be recruited in the british army so they carried out a lot of these recruitments in india and they uh, recruited a lot of the indian soldiers and they promised that they would give them good reforms as a result of this loyalty so the indians were expecting a lot more reforms in in the form of more for reforms and uh, i mean they were not satisfied after the introduction uh, so yeah they felt they felt i mean they, they felt betrayed secondly the muslim hindus were struggling for self rule yeah muslims and the hindus they they were expecting that the british might agree to the self rule demand but they didn't they they did give these transport subjects under the control but there was no hint for the self rule uh which and obviously all the real power was still in the hands of the british all of the transferred subjects were to be reported to the provincial legislative councils this is why they were opposed voishoy had the most power in india at that time so this power growing power of the voishoy was a threat to the indian politics uh the voishoy could impose or remove any law um without the consult without consulting the indians this power uh, was actually a threat to the indians and this is why they opposed these reforms guys the voting rights were increased to 2% this meant the 2% of the population 2% i mean of the population more people could actually vote for vote in the elections uh this meant that the obviously they were giving more power to the indians but at the same time the indians felt that this 2% increase was very less they expected more concessions sir and with that we're moving on to the last event the rowlet act of 1919 this rowlet act was introduced by um uh the british and um J J justice rowlet was the voishoy who introduced this, this this act and uh what it meant was that they would counter any revolutionary activity in india because with the opposition of more elementary reforms and the opposition of more for reforms there was a lot of uh, chaos in the subcontinent the indians were constantly opposing every reform the british were trying to introduce and the british felt that nobody was trying to reach a compromise here the indians who weren't supporting them they were actually rejecting all of these reforms so as a result to control this growing threat of the indian subcontinent to to control the nationalism to i mean the, the growing nationalist activities in india british had passed this law which restricted all of these revolutionary activities they said that they could now arrest without warrant detention without bail and they had the rights over the people who had to live these are very important points guys arrest without warrant detention without bail and right to choose where the indians would live um okay this act was opposed by the indians they started protests strikes all across india jinnah had resigned from the imperial council gandhi had started these strikes against these proposals and this act led to this amritsar massacre it took place in 1919 what happened was that the indians they they gathered in this jallianwala bagh for a public meeting a peaceful demonstration 20000 indians were gathered in that area to demonstrate that the british must withdraw this uh, act over here because it was just against the freedom of expression and freedom of speech um general dyer was the british commander who basically arrived with his forces and they closed all the entrances and he ordered his soldiers to fire without any warning 400 people were killed 1200 were injured um and yeah so this was the amritsar massacre or it is also it's also known as the jallianwala bagh tragedy indians were just there for this peaceful protest and the british they had used force against the indians um and killed 400 people including women children um general dyer was removed uh, later on because of this act Uh, but still he wasn't given any punishment this was a turning point in history the indians uh, were i mean they they had they were further united they knew that the british um they didn't actually care for the indians they were there just to showcase their power and anything that goes against their policies anything that goes against their ideology 
the British were, I mean, British used to use force against those communities to just um, remove that threat. And this is this Chaliambala Bagh tragedy, the Amritsar massacre is a perfect example of how the British has, had, had used extreme force against the people who um, were just demonstrating, protesting against this unlawful act known as the Rowlett Act. We're done with this topic here. Um, guys, is there any question? Anything that is not clear to anyone here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So assignment for today. Please note down these questions, guys. Number one, why did the Congress oppose the more elementary reforms in 1909? Seven mark question. Why did the Congress oppose the more elementary reforms? The second question is why was the Lucknow Pact signed in 1916? Another seven mark question. I'm repeating, why was the Lucknow Pact signed in 1916? Seven mark on page number 14 of the PDF. And the third question is why did the Indians oppose the Montfort reforms? On page number 17, seven mark question, why did the Indians oppose the Montfort reforms? Submission is 10 p.m. Pakistan time along with all the previous questions that are left. Uh, sir, you know, these the three questions and then yeah. there's the two questions in the fourth, a total of five. So I don't think I'll get it done before 10 because I have another class at seven as well. So okay. could I submit all of these by tomorrow at 10 o'clock? Tomorrow, 10 p.m.? Yeah. Okay, all right, that's fine. Okay, thank you, sir. No problem. Um, okay, so we're gonna end the meeting now. Um, just a second, let me see what, if we have the notes of philosophy here. Yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, yeah, let's look at these timeline questions. They're also important. Um, timeline questions are basically all these um questions that ask you to analyze these events uh, for a given timeline for example if you look at this question were the more elemental reforms the most important attempt by either the muslims hindus or british in seeking the solution to the problems of government between 1906 and 1920 so out of all the events that took place between 1906 to 1920 you need to tell which attempt was the most important to seek a solution um, now those attempts could either be made by the British, Hindus, or the Muslims. So the perfect way to attempt such a question is to, first of all, write down all the events that took place in between that timeline. 1906 to 1920. The first event that took place in 1906 was the Simla deputation. The second event was the formation of Muslim League. Similar deprivation in 1906, Muslim League again in 1906, more Liminto reforms in 1909, reversal of partition in 1911, um, Lucknow Pact, 1916, and then Montfort reforms, 1919, Rowlett Act, 1919, and Amritsar Massacre, 1919. So this is a summary of all the events that we have studied up till now. The question asks you to write about the most important event. So to seek a solution, Ahmed, what do you think, which event was the most important to look for a solution?
Um, maybe the morally mental reforms. Morally mental reforms. Okay, so if you think that morally mental reforms were the most important, so what you need to do is because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay, eight points. Huh? So what you can do is you can make up two points for morally mental reforms. Um, then what then, okay, after you write about more elemental reforms, you should move according to the timeline. Write one point for similar deputation, one point for Muslim League, two, three, four. Then you could write maybe you can you can maybe skip reversal of partition. You can write one point for Lucknow Pact and another point for Montford reforms. This is how you will basically be writing seven points. But why are we writing two points for volume of reforms? Because you think these were the most important points. And then in the evaluation, you're going to tell that you think more elemental reforms were the most important. And even if you look at this question, this the pattern here, the, the standard uh, answer also states that the more elemental reforms are the most important. And they've written two points for this. So this is an ideal um, pattern to attempt this question. But how to, I mean, what should you write there? How your content must be analyzed? So you're, the, the question is asking that which of these uh, attempts were the most important in seeking a solution. So you need to talk about how these reforms added to the progress in the subcontinent. How did these reforms work for the solutions? Um, I mean, let's let's read this answer for, for first of all. The Mole Mento reforms were an attempt to solve the problem of the subcontinent by the British. Because before these reforms, the Indian Council Act was introduced in which there was, there was little Indian participation in the councils. It was the demand of Indians that their participation should be increased. So to fulfill these demands and to satisfy the Indians, the British introduced the Mole Mento reforms in which the Indian seats in councils were increased. The Indian wish of more participation in the councils was somewhat fulfilled due to the Mole Mento reforms. This analysis is very important. That how did this more elemental reforms? How did this introduction? How, how did the introduction of more elemental reforms um, added? To, uh, I mean, how did this basically contribute to the solutions to the problems? It gave Indians more participation in the councils, and they were somewhat satisfied because of that. Another reason was the acceptance of the Muslim demands. Muslims were given with separate electorates, and this is why they now had a greater weightage, more say in the politics of India. This is, I mean, this is another reason as to why the more limited reforms were an important attempt to seek a solution. Once you're done with that, you're going to move on to level four. This was level three, two points for level three, and then level four, you're going to write five points on level four for any other five reasons. And then one evaluation at the end. Is this clear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you're not attempting this question right now, but this, but it will, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll assign you as a homework for the weekend. Um, just, just, you should just write down the pattern here. We will be attempting these timeline questions later. All right, so that is it. I'll, I'll, this can, I'll end the meeting now and we'll have our geography class tomorrow. Take care, Nafis. Nafis.